Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Gregory Gale. I am the Director of Recruitment Admissions for NSU's College of Psychology. Um, we have a wonderful session planned for you this afternoon. Uh, today's webinar is titled Awareness and Dialogue on Gender and Orientation Experiences. Before we start, a few things to remember. Um, our session today will be around 90 minutes long. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website in the next few days. Uh, the recording will be at nova.edu forward slash shark chats. Again, nova.edu forward slash shark chats. Concerning the format, um, I'll be introducing our presenters shortly. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we will be answering your questions. Um, we would like you to use the chat feature to submit your questions. I'll be monitoring the questions. Uh, and yes, we do welcome your questions. We would like this to be as interactive uh, as possible. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. Our first panelist is Joseph uh, Zalobchuk. Um, Joseph uh, serves as the executive director of the YES Institute. He's been with that organization uh, for 25 years. As executive director, he supports and guides an amazing team who leads continuing education courses for teachers, uh, mental health therapists, uh, and medical professionals, uh, professionals across South Florida and nationally. His aim is to reduce health disparities of youth and families impacted by gender stereotypes and anti-gay social stigma. Joseph has also co-produced and directed uh, the LGBTQ diversity and inclusion video training for the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau, Miami Begins With Me Hospitality Online Training Certification Program. He completed his Master's of Education from the University of Miami in May 2012 and was awarded the Student Silver Medallion uh, Award for Humanitarian Service from the Mi Miami Coalition of Christians and Jews of that year. Welcome, Joseph. Terrence, or TJ Johnson, is an education and inclusion specialist at the YES Institute. In this capacity, he leads various discussions and trainings around gender identity uh, and sexual orientation uh, diversity topics. TJ was born and raised in Miami, Florida, and identifies as a proud trans man. He came out as transgendered while serving as the vice president of his sorority. Uh, TJ graduated from the University of Miami with a BA in political science uh, and a BS in psychology. Welcome, TJ. Uh, Nicholas Monteleo, Monteleo, thank you. Uh, Nicholas serves as a youth empowerment coordinator as, at the YES Institute. Uh, in this capacity, he, he is eager to share his wisdom, again, from his gender transition to help younger generations feel seen and empowered. He's a graduate of Acceleration Academy, a unique second chance high school that helped Nicholas realize how much he loved inspiring youth of diverse gender and orientation experiences. While attending the academy, uh, Nicholas advocated for the school to remain open at nights so working youth and young mothers could complete their education while maintaining their financial support. Post-graduation, Nicholas volunteered at Pride Lines Community Kitchens to provide food to youth and young adults within the Pride community. He joined the YES Institute in March 2022. Uh, welcome, Nicholas. So with that said, I would welcome our presenters, uh, and please, let's start our conversation. Thank you so much, Greg, for that wonderful introduction, and we're really glad to be here with all of you. Again, my name is Terrence Johnson. You can call me TJ, um, and I'll be leading the conversation that we're having today, um, and really glad to be on the call with all of you. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. All right. So 
As mentioned, our topic is going to be on awareness and dialogue on gender and orientation experiences. Give me one second. Okay. So we really just want to reiterate, um, before we start this conversation, we want everyone to feel welcome. We want you to bring your whole self to this topic in this discussion. We really want all your personal values, religious beliefs, and cultural traditions to remain whole and full and complete in this discussion as we talk about how to be more inclusive and, and create an environment that's safe for all people. Um, and we really want you to feel welcome to open up and share anything that you have, any questions that you have. Um, we're not here to try to change your minds. We just want to connect to your hearts so that way we can create an environment that's welcoming for everybody. So as you all have put in the chat explaining where you're from um, and we've gotten your names a little bit, uh, please share any pronouns that you would like to and, and also share what messages you heard growing up about gay and or transgender people. So these can be anything that you've heard growing up, you know, from your family, from friends, or if you haven't heard any messages at all, feel free to share. Okay, we have a few people chiming in. We have Nicole from Baldwin Academy. Nice to meet you. And is it Ada from Algigas from Lucas Counseling? Okay, Rachel, she, her, says that her mother is a pastor, so didn't hear so many great messages. Yeah, I can relate to that as well. I grew up in a Christian household, so I didn't hear a lot of positive messages either. But that's a lot of the messaging that we received is from growing up. So it's something to think about. And then we have Heather, who is non-binary from Florida. Welcome. Mark, he, him, no real negative messages. Eileen says that they came from a Catholic upbringing and that gay is a sin. Mm -hmm. And Mackenzie says she, her, I went to a public art school from 2012 to 2016. So I got a lot of positive messaging from my school and teachers who were very supportive. I'm really glad to hear that. I'm really glad that you were able to have that support there. And then Bilzi, she, her, any pronouns from NSU school psychology program. The topic was often avoided a lot of the time. Yeah, that's something else that we're going to talk about as to why people are just so afraid to talk about this topic and why it's still very taboo. And then Tina, she, her, growing up, there wasn't much education offered in my school on the LGBT plus community, but among my peers, it was usually negative. Yeah, it's, you hear a lot of mixed messages here. My mother was open. Alma says, she, her, growing up, I did not hear any conversations. This was avoided. Yeah, a lot of you have mentioned that. And then Samantha says, I've heard some very negative things going up, especially from church elders and members. And then Rachel comes back and says, but I did change my own path during undergrad and became the president of the LGBTQ club there and changed my relationship with religion recently with loving community. That's very beautiful to hear, Rachel. Doing the self-work makes a very big difference. All right. Well, thank you all so much for chiming in. We really appreciate it. Um, all your messages. And we're going to be interacting like this a lot throughout the entire session. So please come on, keep ch um, chiming in and keep ch putting your messages in the chat. You're doing a great job so far. So a little bit about what we do at the Yes Institute. We're a nonprofit organization um, whose message is really, whose mission is really just um, to create a, a community where all youth develop as healthy individuals, free of suicide, violence, and discrimination. And we do this through powerful communication and education on gender and orientation. So we go into different schools, religious communities, um, hospitals, corporations, and just talk to them about what it means to be a part of, you know, a gender and orientation diverse background and experience. And really just educate people as much as possible on these topics, such as we're doing today. So, we want to hear from you all again. What do you think are the most common verbal slurs in elementary and middle schools? Or what might have you experienced growing up? 
And what do you think youth are experiencing today? So what do you think youth are hearing, you know, amongst their, their peers on the playground, in the lunchroom, in the classroom? What do you think are the most common verbal slurs? Okay, Ali says that's so gay as if it's a bad thing. Yeah, Lisa says the same thing, that's so gay. Rachel says sissy. Yeah, you all are nailing it. A lot of anti-gay slurs that are being said to our, our students at such a young age. McKinsey says people saying it's a mental disorder when people come out as trans. Yeah, that's another one. Nicole says stop acting gay. Yeah, so you all are nailing it. These are the slurs that we're hearing, that our youth are hearing. The F slur, yes. And it's still very, Sarah, it's still common today as well with our youth. And the reason why we bring this up, Madonna, yeah, I can see your message. Um, the reason why we, we are bringing this up is because our students are still hearing these things. They're still experiencing these topics. And it's not just students that are from diverse gender and orientation experiences, but students that are also heterosexual and cisgender, they're hearing these slurs. They're being witnesses to anti-gay physical violence on a monthly or, or weekly basis even. And so that's why it's so important that we talk about these things because it's affecting everyone, not just our you know, gender and orientation diverse students. So on the screen here, we have three boys. One is doing ballet, one is playing soccer, and one is playing basketball. Let's say that they're all in the, you know, in the playground together. Who do you think is most likely to hear these slurs or get made fun of just off of their appearance only? Who do we think? Mark says the ballet dancer. Yeah, a lot of you say the ballet dancer, Madonna, Rachel. Sarah says the two kids on the left. Eileen says the dancer. Okay, yeah. So why do you think the ballet dancer and the soccer player may be more likely to hear these slurs or be made fun of? Why do you think the reasoning is behind that? Or what may cause them to be the targets more easily? Rachel says they look girly. Mark says does not fit the standard cultural norm for their gender. Exactly. McKenzie says wearing leggings. Tina says they are displaying stereotypically non-masculine mannerisms, behaviors. Yes, you all are nailing this completely. And that's the point that we want to make is that just completely off of appearance, we associate certain things with being feminine or with being masculine. And, you know, uh, and the, uh, it all comes down to like what you all have said, the gender expression and the messaging that we've heard growing up about what relates to certain genders, all of that plays a role in what our kids are internalizing and then growing up to become adults and then perpetuating out into the world themselves. So thank you all for all your comments because you're nailing it right on the head. Um, um, TJ, yeah. could I just jump in? Because I saw a comment from, I believe it was Mark. If we could just go back one slide. Yes. Um, Mark, you mentioned uh, something about then kids are called names and given labels that they may not really be. I think your comment was uh, like a girl, just because she's doing sports, then might get called lesbian and then then feels pressure to either adopt or reject that label. And the same situation is happening here. These are really just young people exploring activities that they like in the world. And then there's all these labels put upon them. So also, if these were all a bunch of female students, then might who get bullied or targeted with labeling and pressure? Yeah, Rachel also chimes in. Yes, the stereotype, all softball players are lesbians. So we see that gender bias also equally impacts heterosexual identified young people and adults when we don't fit gender stereotypes from expectations. So thank you for bringing that in. I wanted to just loop that in, TJ. That was perfect. Thank you for catching that. All right. And to further talk about what we're to reiterate what we were talking about, we have here um, a survey from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey um, study, I'm sorry, and it, what it shows is the 
amount of percentage of students who have, have attempted suicide at least one or more times during the year um, before the survey. And the blue line are heterosexual students and the purple line are lesbian, gay, and bisexual students. Now, any student committing suicide or attempting is already a red flag and a very big issue. But just to see the discrepancy between the blue and the purple line, that's where the major issue comes in. It shouldn't be that we shouldn't have any students that are attempting suicide, but to have the, the gap be that large between two different groups, just based off of one identity, that is a problem. And then we also take a look to see that the pandemic had some effects as well, that the purple line seemed to be going down, um, but until, until it hit the pandemic and the numbers seemed to be creeping back up again. So these are something um, to really point out that it's an issue that really is affecting us all and that our students are suffering the consequences of it. And another thing to consider is intersectionality. So looking at how race and ethnicity play a role with gender and orientation. And so we see that 82% of trans non-binary and non-binary black youth are, are not only insulted because of their gender identity, but also experience racial discrimination. And this can lead to them dropping out three times the national average. So just something to be aware that, you know, students are dealing with racial injustice, dealing with gender injustice and orientation, bullying and, and harassment. And it's a lot to deal with at a, a, a such a young age. So we just are con continuously reiterating that it's important that we keep talking about this and doing something to help our students. So does anybody know what implicit bias is? We've kind of touched on it a little bit, um, but who can give me a definition in their own words? Mark says yes. <laughs> who can give me a definition and put it in their own words for me? Okay, Rachel says, because you are or have A, you must be B. Yes, that's an interesting way to look at it. Any other definitions? Sasha says, favoritism, a bias against, Lisa says, a bias against a specific group that may be a result of your upbringing. Yes. Mark says an unconscious bias that you may have that influences how you approach someone different than you? Yes. Okay, I'm looking at all the chats. Yes, Sarah said implicit bias is bias without even thinking about it. Everything you see, you read, seen, heard influences your perceptions of other folks. Yes, it's a bias that we have but might not be aware of. You all, yeah, exactly nailed it. So it's basically like you said, these are social stereotypes that we have about different groups that we form outside of our own conscious awareness. And we all have these beliefs. They're all something that we all use just as a way to protect ourselves, to categorize people for safety precautions, to categorize life so that way we can navigate through it. The only issue that comes into play is how we interact with other people and treat other people because of these implicit biases. So it's just being aware that we have them and catching yourself once you feel yourself falling into that trap of implicit bias. So another question inquiry for you all, what's the first question often asked when someone is pregnant? Mm -hmm, exactly, is it a girl or a boy? <laughs> is she married? That's a good one, Mark. Um, uh, yeah, that's usually the first question that you get asked. So as soon as you're born, you're thrust into this world of, you know, gender. And it's before you even can form words, you're, who you're going to be, what you're going to turn out to become is already being placed on you. That pressure is already being added to you. So here we have the binary worldview that we all operate within. Um, that's just how society, you know, functions and we were all born into it. Um, so as soon as a baby is born, that first question, you know, is it a boy or a girl, immediately we're, look, we're, we're looking at the body. We're looking at, is it a male or a female? And there's really no wiggle room or in between there. So that's what you're called to be. And then if, you're, if we have a baby that's assigned female at birth, 
we expect them gender-wise to express their their you know themselves through very feminine ways and behaviors and then we assume that they're going to be attracted orientation wise to males so looking at this binary worldview we have over 8 million people on the world in the world and do all of these people fit into the you know being female male feminine masculine or being attracted to male and female do we think that everyone fits into this binary worldview perfectly No, yeah, and I see your comment, um, Rachel, about gender reveal parties being the worst. <laughs> yeah, girls get baby dolls. Sarah says girls get baby dolls and play house and weddings. Boys get trucks and play war. Exactly. So it's not fitting into anything. It, we, we're automatically being told or being assumed that we're going to fit into these categories, um, but that's not the case for everybody. But I do want to make one thing clear that it's okay if you do fit this binary. There's nothing wrong with being feminine, a feminine female and being attracted to males. There's nothing wrong with being a masculine male being attracted to females. It's what happens is there are consequences for when you don't fit this binary perfectly. And that's what we're talking about moving forward. And even consequences for fitting it all too well, people can then have judgments about you. Oh, you're a masculine male. So I'm not gonna talk about my emotional problems with you. So people are also interfacing with this binary biases that then limit or affect our interactions with others. Exactly. So now we're going to talk about kind of what that can look like and break it down versus femininity and masculinity. Um, so what are some things that are traditionally considered in society feminine? What do you all think? Rachel says favorite color is pink. Yes. Samantha says teaching, cooking. Mark says ballet. Yes. All of these are traditionally. Mackenzie says playing with dolls. Lisa says foot attire. Rachel and Brandon said, uh, Brandon Hall says dresses, makeup, housekeeping. Yes. So all of these are, Madonna says becoming a housewife and having children. Yes. All of you have nailed it completely. These are things in society that we traditionally deem as, you know, talking about emo emotions, nurturing, staying at home, you know, being a homemaker, accessorizing with jewelry, painted nails, McKinsey says, like all of these things are things that we associate with being a fem female, with being feminine, um, but may not necessarily always be true to what it means to be a woman. So these are just things that we traditionally in society deem as acceptable in society for you to to navigate the world and be as so now we're going to take at masculinity take a look at masculinity what are some traditionally masculine things that we consider in society muscles yes mark says aggressive contact sports that's another one lisa says barbecuing yeah <laughs> um Rachel says, all men know everything about cards and sports. I wish that were true because I know very little about both of those topics. <laughs> um, Madonna says, breadwinner. Being it, McKinsey says, being into trucks, cars. Oh, Sarah, that's a good point. Incompetent, especially in media portrayals. So, yeah, that's a different way of just, you know, feigning ignorance, some type of ignorance in some kind of way. That's a good point. Um, aggressive, and emotional, mechanic. Yeah, you all are, okay, awesome. These are all great examples of traditional masculinity. The, yeah, Sarah, the bumbling male. That is a very huge trope. Oh, and Softer says having multiple sex partners um, is viewed as a primary masculine thing. Yes. So yeah, you all have given some great examples of traditional masculinity. Um, and just all I want to highlight here is that, you know, sometimes in when you pr fit into the binary so well, and you are you exhibiting these behaviors to such a heightened degree, that sometimes can, you know, come off as a very problematic thing. And that's something that we also want to talk about is just how can we um, 
create a space where everyone can be themselves and authentically express who they are and not have to be alpha or not have to be toxic or not have to, you know, show manhood in such a way that isn't really authentic to what it means to be a man. So that's kind of the conversation we want to have here. So thank you all for contributing all the thoughts that you have contributed so far. Okay, so now we have another group discussion. Um, so we want to look at for you all to kind of reflect on what were some gender expectations that you experienced during your own childhood, teen years or adult years, and to also look at did the core of yourself enjoy or reject these expectations? So what were some experiences that you had related to gender growing up? And how did you feel about those experiences? EJ, I'll chime in a little bit as people are thinking and typing. Um, one of the things my dad said to me, he actually raised me pretty gender equitably. He said, when you grow up, whatever profession you pick, I want you to be happy and not just do it because I did it. He worked in the IT industry. Um, and he would say things like, you want to do art, architecture? Great. You want to be an actor? He even said, if you want to just, you know, be a garbage and recycling person, as long as you're happy doing what you're doing, I'll support you. And that was an amazing message my dad gave, but I lived in a society where this binary was also all around me. So I felt very much pressured to conform and pick careers that fit a masculine expectation. So even though I got really egalitarian messages in my house, surrounding me was all these other messages and I still felt impacted by that. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, that really makes a very good point of you know, you can have all the freedom in the world be offered to you, but when you still internalize those messages of your own, it makes it hard to get to see past those expectations, even though your father gave you that freedom to explore any and everything that you wanted to be. So let's see what people are saying in the chat. Oh, we have a lot of comments. Okay, so Samantha says that they were discouraged from playing baseball and Legos. That's not what good girls do. Yeah, even at a young age, being gendered, just the toys that we play with getting gendered. Debbie says, babysitting at 12 years old, it was expected in a large family. I had no opinion. I think it was it prepared me for adult life and having my own family. So even being taught as a child to, you know, practicing these gender roles of what it means to be a bread, uh, a homemaker. Rachel says, expected me for me to wear dresses and like makeup and to want to go to school dances. Yep, the typical, you know, path for a woman and a girl growing up. Mark says, father tried to force me into engineering. I preferred nurturing and empathetic clinical psychology. He then said, you better get a PhD, otherwise you would not be respected. So yeah, even, even in a field that may seem, you know, woman dominated, you have to be the best at that field in order to prove your own masculinity there. And, you know, and you still chose your own path, Mark. So good on you. But growing up, the good girl boys are better. Laura says, I was told college would be a waste since I'd marry and be supported, but I was supposed to take a secretarial job to support my brother's education and he didn't want to go to college. Wow, that is very fascinating. And I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Um. And then uh, Shelly says, I did not particularly like dolls, et cetera. I preferred math, science, sports. I was called a tomboy. And my mother made me wear a dress to school at least once each week. Yeah, so even policing your own, you know, children just to make them feel safe, make a lot of times, you know, parents will police their own children out of fear for their own safety because these expectations have such a weight on everything that we do. Um, let's see who else has comments. So yeah, these are, Sarah says, women should be chast, but always have a boyfriend, get married, young, go to college for my missus, missus degree and have kids. As an adult, straight women are gay till graduation, more sexual partners equals a slut, but also not putting out equals prude, so that's got married late. So yeah, either way you put it, you win, you lose, you win if you, you lose for, for trying either way. 
And, and that's just the point that all of you have highlighted is that there's so much pressure that we put, get placed on us and that we also internalize and put on ourselves just because we're trying to fit into this, these strict, rigid rules that the binary gives us. And that a lot of the times we don't really enjoy at our core, core selves, these expectations. Um, TJ, I just wanted to also add for everybody that has communicated in the chat, and maybe you didn't chat, but you're thinking about your own histories. I'm just like really moved by what everybody wrote. And it's almost like really extreme what a lot of you had faced. Um, forced into careers and things you don't want to do. And so I just wanted to like take a moment and pause and reflect on sort of the humanity that you're sharing with us and know that we see you and we hear you. And this is our work is how can we create, at least for the next generation coming up right behind us, a little bit more room where they don't have to go through some of the tortures that we did. We can have a little bit more space in our society so they don't feel forced to do things that they're not interested in doing anyway or can't do very well or don't want to so i just wanted to pause and let you know like we're reading all of this and we see you and we hear you yes thank you for that joseph and thank you everybody for your vulnerability and openness really appreciate it and so Based off of everything that you all shared and the and you know the talking about the binary that we've all lived through, here are some of the consequences that we can see just through society. You know, the U.S. wage gap is over ten thousand between men and women. The mortality disparity is between seven to thirteen years, depending on what country you live in. Um, the men have a three times higher suicide rate than women do. And men are also 98, almost 99% of those arrested for forcible rape. And then we also see hate crime statistics increasing against transgender and non-binary people. So these are all things that if you don't fit into the binary or if you fit it too well, this is what happens. And these are the things that we need to be aware of. And also keep in mind that our children are coming into this world facing as well. So another inquiry question for you all, is our experience of gender always binary? Is it always black and white as we think it is? What do you all think? Mark says no more fluid, Rachel says no. Yeah. It's, it, we have a lot more flexibility within how we experience our gender. Yeah, a lot of you are saying no. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about kind of how things, we, how we break things down at the S Institute. Um, aside from the binary, we kind of look at the categories as, as separate but interconnected with each other. So we have body, gender, and orientation. And our definition for the body are any physical attributes used to assign female or male binary labels. So that's anything that, you know, that is a part of your physicality, your DNA, your chromosomes, your genitalia, all of that is used to assign binary, you know, or, or like labels in the language that we have. Um, and this also leaves room for intersex people as well. So people that are born with ambiguous genitalia or born with other disorders of um, development um, are, can fall into this category of the body and it includes them with um, non-intersex people. So then we have gender. The, in that, how we define it is the meaning and expectations added or the core of how you experience yourself, how you relate to other people. And so we have, in this category, we also have transgender people. So people that may have been assigned one um, body at birth and then identify gender-wise as another. Um, and so that's how they relate to people. And that's where pronouns become very important. So another way of how people can connect and interact with each other. And then we have orientation, which is the, the direction of your sexual and romantic interests. 
And so we want to really make it clear that gender and orientation are very separate from each other. Um, and that it's really orientation is really just comes down to who you're interested in romantically and sexually. And um, the reason why we bring this up is because there's a lot of different language that people have come up with to define themselves and identify themselves. And so we want to bring some of those terms here in case you haven't seen them before. So just take a look at this list. And if there's any word that you're unsure about, um, just put it in the chat and we can discuss it. Demisexual. Okay, so we'll go over demisexual and neurocro. Demisexual really kind of comes down to um, a person that has to have a connection with another human being first before they can have a sexual interaction with them. So they may, they're not asexual in that they don't want to have any sexual relationship at all, um, but they need to, they have a demisexual sexuality in that they aren't um, they have to get to know a person on a deeper level, an intellectual level, before they can move forward with them sexually. Um, neuroqueer is kind of an interesting term that a lot of younger people have used. Um, so we've um, there's a lot of research that points to um, autism being co-correlated with um, gender uh, dysphoria. And so a lot of the times, um, we'll see people that have gender dysphoria also being tested for autism spectrum disorder. And so uh, because of this co-occurring um, um, diagnosis, sometimes the term neuroqueer comes up for anyone who identifies as being neuroatypical. So not being, you know, typically having uh, the neuropath of someone else, um, they will use it. And they're also queer. They also use that term. Um, to kind of show both of their identities. Um, and let me see if there's any other ones. Yeah. Demisexual. If anybody is interested in the research that TJ citing, um, Strang, S-T-R-A-N-G, is one of the top researchers uh, internationally on the co-occurrence of autism and gender dysphoria in the literature. And this is an emerging finding that we're discovering. So, um, it's it's creating a lot of awareness at autism conferences and research studies and in the transgender research field. Uh, we don't fully understand it. We're just discovering this. Uh, so there's a um, those of you who want to go to graduate school, there's a lot of research opportunities here that we're uncovering. So thank you for your questions about this. Yes. Um, I also want to just share anecdotally. Um, this is not just the research. All of us here at Yes Institute have personally experienced this. We went to a school, a special school here in Miami. They only have 80 students and they have 80 teachers. It's a one-to-one -one high intensity learning environment. Most of the youth that attend the school are neuroatypical or on the autism spectrum in some way, shape or form. The school told us uh, when we did a faculty presentation that like 60% of their students identify as trans or non-binary, which is a very high number, uh, and, and they have a very sort of select population. So we're looking at the research and we're also experiencing this anecdotally as well. Yes. Thank you for that, Joseph. And then Bill Z says, I've always explained demisexuality as needing to gain enough experience points to reach a certain level, i.e. feel attraction. Okay, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, it's strange, so S-T-R-A-N-G-E for the spelling of the researcher. And then genderqueer from, for Mark. Okay, so genderqueer um, is another term that's usually used um, by younger folks to kind of express how they see their gender of not really being uh, their gender is, they're not really, you know, uh, transgender, but they may fall into the non-binary category. And so they just describe their gender identity as being genderqueer because they don't see it fitting as either male or female. They're just um, kind of seeing where they're, they're looking at their gender as just being queer as a whole. So they may just identify with using they, them pronouns in some cases or other pronouns 
that like Z or Zir that we may have. Um, so that's kind of what gender queer means. And gender fluid, that can fall in the same category as well as gender queer. It's just seeing that their fluidity, their gender is more on a spectrum um, and not so stagnant. It's more fluid. EJ, I did pull up the autism research study. So if you mm -hmm. want to stop sharing, I can share it really quick oh, since some yeah. students are asking about it. Uh, here we go. Um, so this is from PubMed. And um, so they did, this was a meta-analysis. They looked at five different data sets. So we have autism diagnosis by gender identity. So we see cisgender male. So assigned male at birth identifies as male, cisgender female, and then you see gender diverse. So this is the research finding that many, many researchers are discovering around this population. And the data sets, um, the N comes to over six, 641,000 people. So it's a pretty robust uh, research phenomenon that we're uncovering and, and brings us to more questions and also really kind of reframes the way we're looking at both trans and autism together and separately. Thank you for that. Okay, let me go back to sharing. Okay, and now we're gonna hear from our speaker of the day, who is Nicholas Montolio. Um, he's gonna share with us his experience as it relates to gender and orientation. Hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm Nicholas Montolio and I am a young trans man. Um, since very young, I had always been the stereotypical tomboy. Um, I would give my mother hell just for trying to put me in a dress. And so growing up, um, I always felt just a little bit out of place with the girls uh, that I was friends with. And in fourth grade, I kind of just had this observation of myself in the way that I interacted with the girls in the class and the boys. Uh, they were all discussing that they had crushes on um, the boys in class, and I just didn't feel that way whatsoever. And I started to think, well, um, I must be weird. And so, you know, when I connected with the boys, it was a sense out of um, competitiveness and wanting to prove myself and be one of them. And so that year it was, I was at the early doctor's checkup and I expressed that I was weird for not having felt the same way that the girls did in school. And he just kind of reassured me that I'm a kid, just be a kid, don't worry about it. And so I went on and the year before entering middle school, I kind of felt truly uh, ashamed because I could not see myself growing out of this tomboy phase. And I just saw the girls, um, they love to wear their short shorts and their tank tops and blouses. And I was always the girl with basketball shorts and a t-shirt. And so I had my head down on the bench and my, my childhood best friend, she approaches me and she asks me what's wrong. And I explained to her that you know, I don't think that I'm going to grow out of this tomboy phase. And I felt deeply ashamed about it. And she just reassured me that eventually I will. And so by the time that I'm already in middle school, um, I am being kind of bombarded with, are you a lesbian? Are you gay? You know, what are you? And um, I think I truly knew that I was different but I just wasn't ready to accept that for myself. And so I would try my best to um, not have to answer these questions. And then one day I realized I had feelings for a girl. And so when I was approached with these questions, I would then say, um, I'm bisexual, just to kind of feel like less of a subject of attention because if they thought that I liked boys, I wouldn't be, um, so, such a subject of attention, you know? And so uh, as time went on, I am now in seventh grade and 
my my friend um I'm at her house and she's cutting her hair and um I just got this urge you know to just just do it I knew I wanted to do it um in in sixth grade but I, I didn't allow myself to so I you know I thought what could hold me back so I cut my hair and I gets down to like this length and you can imagine I had a very thick long wavy hair and so now it's just short and wavy and I'm skating back home and my mom just happened to be standing outside greeting my cousin who's visiting and she takes a look at me and she's like oh my god what did you do to your hair <laughs> and um my cousin she looks at me and she's like what do you mean it looks great and I and I go I know right <laughs> and so my mom's freaking out um we live in an apartment so I go upstairs and I get to my sister's door in her bedroom. I grew up with just my mom and my sister. And so um, having my sister take a glance at me um, and she, her response was, it looks more like you. It, it just meant everything to me because at that moment, it seemed like uh, I was giving myself permission to explore who I was. And so I'm still in seventh grade at that point. And um, my friend dares me to go into the boys' bathroom. And we were outside the lunchroom. So, you know, there's a boys' bathroom here, and a girl, girl's bathroom here, and we're all lined up. And so um, part of my personality, I love a challenge. So, you know, I go, why not? And I walk into the boys' bathroom, and I'm having this sense of adrenaline rush and uh I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm doing it. But it also felt like really natural. And so I come back out. <laughs> and one of the first things I say is that I could do that again. And uh, it didn't take long for him to eventually approach me. And he tells me, you know, I think um, I think you're transgender. I think you're a boy. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, how funny, because when I was younger, I told myself, I was gonna grow up to be a boy. I just never knew how that was gonna happen. And I had pushed that feeling away for so long and it just began to resurface. And so I decided to look up um, what transgender is uh, and an image of a trans male popped up. He was shirtless and very muscular. And I kept thinking, oh my God, like, can I do that? And uh, it just, it literally just clicked for me my behavior growing up, who I was, why I didn't resonate with being a lesbian or bisexual or gender fluid, it all just started to make sense. And for the first time I felt relieved because I just I just got that that was who I was. And it was a, a, a literal sense of gender euphoria. And I was so empowered by that moment. And so, um, it didn't take long. I started socializing as Nicholas and and um by the time that I was in eighth grade, I was ready to share that with my mom and my sister because I was kind of living as her at home, but him at outside of the house. And so it was just this eagerness to share. Um, they never expressed that they would cause any harm, but it was still a sense of nervousness for me. And so I remember being in the kitchen counter and I share with my mom first, no mom, I'm not lesbian, I'm a boy and I still like girls. And she kind of looks at me and she's like, what? Like, you know, isn't being gay more fun? And so I just thought, what a funny response. And, um, I had to explain to her like, you know, no, like I still like girls, I'm just a boy. And, you know, she just let me be. Uh, she was, and I knew that she didn't fully understand, but you know, just whatever Nick wants. And so um, I I tell my sister and um, she just got on the ball with it right away. And I was genuinely surprised. And so by the time that I'm entering high school, I learn about uh, minors being able to medically transition and at that point, I was socializing as Nicholas for a year with my family, with my friends and at school. And so I was just ready for that next step. 
And um, growing up, I had been in behavioral therapy my whole life. Uh, <laughs> my whole family describes me as being an angry child. <laughs> I understand why now. And so um, having to learn that I had to get back into therapy to be able to start hormones, it was a bit annoying for me, but um, I just... I just did it. And so I made it really clear it was uh, the difficult part about finding a therapist. Um, you know, this is 2016. So this topic wasn't talked about enough. And if there were therapists who were working with trans uh, clients, it was private. I could not afford that. I was on government insurance. And so I had to go through whatever the government was going to give me. And so I made it really clear with them, you know, I'm, I'm Nicholas, I'm doing this because I want my letter so that I can start hormones, you know, at that moment in my life, I didn't have um, any mental and emotional turmoil going on with me. And I also just didn't know that you could be in therapy and talk about all the great things happening in your life. And so um, when I started therapy, I found myself having to make up stories so that I could stay long enough to receive my letter. And um, by the third month, we were almost reaching four months of therapy. And I was I was genuinely annoyed because at this point, I'm manipulating you to get me something and I don't want that. And I made it very clear in the beginning. And um, my therapist's response was, well, you're our first trans client, so you're like a guinea pig to us. And I, you know, at that time, I didn't know that it's probably something you shouldn't say to a client of yours. And so um, she reaches out to me, she lets me know that her boss has my letter and that they want me to come into the office. And so I go into the office and uh, I had the letter in front of me. I sign it, my mom signs it. Um, my um, ex-girlfriend at the time she's there with me to witness it all and so the her boss comes up to me and she goes well what are you going to do now you know and in my mind I'm like this is all I needed from you I don't want to continue therapy and so I guess that she was expecting me to um continue on with therapy and I was like you know I'm just going to start hormones and that's it I don't know what else to expect. And I guess that wasn't the answer that she was looking for. Um, which, you know, like I said, it was upsetting because I didn't, I made it clear in the beginning and I didn't want to manipulate anybody. And it felt like that was the case. And so I got my appointment. I waited six months because it takes a very long time. And I then started hormones in my sophomore year, on the first week, um, I did not have the experience that I was expecting. I was experiencing a shortness of breath and um, this high amount of anxiety. And um, it was just anxiety attack after anxiety attack. And uh, the only explanation at that moment was it must be testosterone because that was the only thing that had changed in my life. And so I was really, I was really upset and frustrated and really heartbroken because I wanted it to work for me. You know, I, in my mind, I had this goal to be a teenage boy throughout high school. And I was, I was just, devastated that that wasn't what I was experiencing and I just even got to the point where I even thought well if am I even transgender and at that point I I couldn't turn to my community my community at the time was having this feud about uh being trans you have to have gender dysphoria and at the time I I didn't really understand gender dysphoria because I had experiences great empowerment after figuring out who I was um, and so I always got the message that we have to hate our bodies and I just didn't feel that way. And so I just had to give it up. I had to give in to the resistance that I was experiencing in order to feel some relief. And so I took it upon myself to 
I first got to get this anxiety under control. And I meditated. And that was something I did for a whole year. I would wake up and for 15 minutes, I just meditated. You know, I didn't really know what I was going to expect after um, meditation. But, you know, after one year, I kind of just got this this profound feeling of I'm not choosing testosterone to change anything about me and that there was nothing to change about me that I was completely whole as a young boy the whole time and when that was really clear for me I then chose testosterone from a place of self-love self-acceptance for exactly the way that I was and to choose it to enhance my experience living as a teenage boy and when I got that I restarted hormones and it was the best experience I had ever had thank you Nico thank you so much for opening yourself and opening your heart to us about kind of your internal process of of your journey and we wanted to open it up to all of you all here in the call um you're getting some thank yous <laughs> uh you might have some questions for nico um about his experiences about what our other young people are experiencing uh we have a youth um empowerment Leadership Council at Yes Institute, and Nico is our leader of that uh, empowerment and leadership group. So Nico is available to, you know, share his perspective and share his wisdom and insight with us. Well, as we as we wait for our um, attendees to uh, ask questions, first, I just want to say thank you so much. That was incredibly powerful. Um, both Terrence uh, and Nicholas sharing your information with us. Um, I was actually texting a few people um, as they were listening to your conversation, and uh, it was quite moving. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, let's start off the conversation um, with this. So um, this is really important and powerful information. So tell us how we can have this kind of conversation with individuals who may not be receptive uh, to this information. So um, I'd love individuals to walk away from this webinar feeling um, that they have at least some of the skills needed to have this kind of conversation with others. So um, how do we do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it starts with meeting people where they are and being able to engage with them at the level of understanding that they are capable of um, and starting there and getting people to connect on a personal level of this topic because it impacts all of us. So it's, if we can see the humanity behind what someone's going through and put a human face to an issue, it'll really make a big difference to, to make it so that way we can actually have a conversation about this. And it's not us just talking about abstract things, but we're talking about real people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I envision some of these conversations taking place over the dinner table, whether it's Thanksgiving or it's a barbecue, a Fourth of July barbecue. Yeah, it can happen anywhere at any time. So, mm -hmm. um, TJ, maybe you want to share about the process in your own family where yes. this has come up and some of the positive shifts that come that have come up. Yeah, so um, I'm transgender as well. Um, from my bio that Greg so graciously read out for everybody. Um, and I have had to have this conversation with my uncle, who is devoutly religious. He works for a church. And so he was very resistant to talking about it at all um, and would never address me as his nephew. He just keeps referring to me as his niece. So it really came down to me trying to sit down with him using the tools that I've learned from the Yes Institute through communication models to be able to see him as, okay, this is where he's coming from. These are the messages that he's received growing up. 
and he's internalized them. It's not a reflection of me as a person. Um, I'm still whole as an individual. So once I got that, that he's dealing with his own internalized messaging that isn't reflective of me as a human being, then I was able to see him for where he was coming from and be able to see, okay, you're not there where I need you to be as an uncle, but we can work towards having a relationship, um, you know, aside from me being trans. So it really just came down to being honest with him and saying that the things that the way that you treat me and the, how you refer to me, it impacts me and it, in a negative way. And when I came to him from a heart place instead of a head place, then we were able to actually have a conversation and talk about, OK, I, I don't get it. I don't understand transgender identity at all, but I do see you and I see you as, you know, a member of my family. So we aren't 100% there yet, but we're getting towards it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nicholas, uh, you have a question in the chat. Um, when you were in school, would you have welcomed open dialogue with your teachers and adults in your life? How can I approach students in a way that is respectful? That's a great question. Um, actually, my biggest headaches were teachers because um, I was an open book. And so uh, I think that it led for asking me questions that I didn't really want to answer. And sometimes I didn't know how to answer them. Um, there was one time where um, I was asked if they could see a picture of what I looked like before. And I just didn't know, I didn't want to reject them. Um, just because I didn't know that I could just say, no, I don't want to do that. And so I remember sharing a picture of myself and they would tell me, well, you were so beautiful. And it just was like very cringy feeling. And um, as well as being asked, like, are you sure about this? And, um, you know, your brain isn't fully developed. And like, I just didn't know how to answer that because it's uh, such a personal and an internal realization for myself that whatever I say, uh, I don't think that it would intellectually make sense. And so um, it was kind of like, and I think that's where I got caught up in trying to prove to everyone that I can be a teenage boy and I can do hormones at a young age. And you know, I just got caught up in this uh, egotistical way of being. Well, I, I would love for both of you to sort of talk about sort of at, would it have been easier if you, um, sort of found your true self as an earlier age or the journey that you actually have traveled made you sort of better? Um, so is it, was it, would it have been easier if you sort of came out, uh, earlier? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say the easy answer is yes, but I also, I do not regret the journey. I think that I, um, um, Although I, I would say I got rid of her, um, I did appreciate being a little girl growing up because it just saw me what I didn't like and what I didn't want. And it, and it pointed me towards what feels good. Yeah, and I think for me, I agree with what Nicholas said. Um, it really just came down to allow me, I think I would have preferred to, you know, have more accessibility when I was younger. Um, to to start hormones and everything, but I do appreciate the journey because I came out in college of being able to define for myself what masculinity looks like and um, put it into my own version for myself. And I don't think I would have been able to do that as much if I had that early on experience of being, you know, being raised as a young boy. So. Um, there's a question in the chat um, uh, that is, I think, quite powerful, and uh, I'm just I'm going to read it. Um, I was unaware of my daughter being trans until she sent me an email from several states away telling me of her discovery. I didn't think that was the best way of telling me, but her therapist told her to do it that way. I think an uh, open conversation would be more effective and less traumatic. I didn't know she was seeing a therapist, even though she was living with me and her father. 
Um, she had no idea, we had no idea she was trans until she told us there were no signs. I still don't know how to explain her transition, even though I have accepted this. Uh, you know, I think many parents go through this. Um, Nicholas, you talked about your relationship with your mother. Um, TJ, you talked about the relationship you had with the, your uncle. So I guess a two part question would be, um, would someone, a parent, not know the journey you were going through? Um, and then what would be the best way to share that information with uh, uh, a family member? Yeah, I can start off. Um, so I know for my mom, she didn't know. There were little clues that there was something different about me growing up. But for the most part, she didn't know that she was going to have a transgender child. She would, just wasn't aware. Um, and so I think the way that I told her, I told her over the phone while I was in another city um, away in college. And so I didn't have that. And we always had an open relationship where we could talk about anything, but I didn't, I would have preferred to, you know, have a sit down conversation and, you know, actually sit down and say, hey, this is what it means for me. Instead of me being like in tears, <laughs> you know, blubbering just on mm -hmm. over the phone with her. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it comes down to how the person feels safe wise. If they feel comfortable enough to disclose in general, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that they disclose, it's just going to be how comfortable they feel with that person. It's not a reflection on, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't tell my mom over the phone because I was afraid of her. It was more so because I didn't know what the reaction was going to be in general. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't know how, I didn't want to be rejected. That was my biggest fear. And so it it really just came down to if it was safe enough for me to share it and how I wanted to maintain my safety when I did share it. Mm. Thank you. Nicholas? You know, um, well, first, thank you, Debbie, for sharing that. I, it just brought to my mind um, the topic that's coming up about uh, kids and youth just really being themselves and not letting their parents know, and it's becoming a huge issue. I also think it just comes down to not wanting to be rejected. And I don't think that they purposely keep it from you as a malicious uh, attempt. It's really, uh, they're just trying to navigate it on their own. And until they're fully certain, then they wanna share. I'm gonna go back to an earlier question that I had um, concerning sort of, talking to people who may not um, be receptive to this. I'm gonna switch and talk about individuals who are welcoming and accepting of this. There's a question concerning how do you handle negativity and bias from coworkers or people in the public? So tell us some best practices um, when maybe a colleague, a friend, uh, cousin uh, decides to do something or say something that um, should be really a teachable moment? Yeah, um, I think it comes down to like dealing with coworkers or anyone in the public, because it's a little bit different when you're dealing with family, how <laughs> you would handle that situation, but dealing with like other people in society, um, I think it really just comes down to that proximity and that relationship that you have with them and how you're able to navigate that. Um, and and it, it's, it also comes down to, you know, if it's a choice, it's a choice. It's a choice as to how you want to engage with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, if your safety is in question, then it wouldn't be advised for you to, you know, step up to them and say, you know, the language that you're using is wrong. We want mm -hmm. you to be aware of safety first. But if safety is not really an issue for you, then you can definitely just say, hey, you know, what you're saying is harmful and hurtful. And these are the reasons why it impacts me. Um, and moving forward through that way of, you know, getting them to see that you don't have to, you know, accept me as a trans person, but you do need to respect me as a human being. So that's what we want, really want to get down to the, the bottom of just respect and being able to treat me by using the right pronouns, by calling me by the, the correct name, um, and just treat me like a, a, any other human being that you would see on the street, even if you didn't know that I was trans to begin with. 
So talk about that initial conversation. Um, you get hired at a company X uh, and you're now being introduced to your coworkers. Um, sort of walk us through that process. So I actually had this experience um, at my previous job before coming to Yes, um, where I had to, I hadn't changed all my legal documentation yet. So I wasn't Terrence Lee on my driver's license yet, um, but I was socially Terrence. And so I had to come out to the HR department and let them know, hey, that, you know, I'm in the process of getting my license changed. Um, it'll be changed within a few weeks but this is the name that I prefer to go by. And so they didn't have the mechanisms to change it in their database to put Terrence, but they could put TJ in parentheses uh -huh. around my name. So they did that. And one of the people in HR just told me, maybe not say anything about, you know, how you identify to your coworkers just for it to be safe. Um, and so I kind of took that as, well, while I'm not able to be my full authentic self in this workplace. So each time, because I felt that way, I, I felt like I had to come out over and over again to different coworkers and explain to them, like, this is what it means for me to be trans. And, you know, it doesn't change anything about who I am. I just use he, him pronouns. And I was assigned female at birth. Like, that's really the difference. And so it 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 came to me having to do a lot more education than I would want to. And I had and, and then there were days where I didn't want to educate at all. So I it 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 just came down to what was comfortable for me mm -hmm. to be around it and, and to work in that space. Um and then fortunately I found the Yes Institute <laughs> where I could be my whole self. <laughs> and you know, they they celebrated me being trans. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, uh, there is a question here for you, TJ, but I would like Nicholas also to actually um, talk about uh, the the question was therapy. Was therapy an option when you were going through your transition? So, uh, Nicholas, you spoke about sort of that process for you. Um, please, again, share concerning sort of your thought on therapy, since, you know, I'm representing the College of Psychology. Either one. I'll let TJ share it because I shared <laughs> my story. Um, well, for me, I did have therapy growing up um, when I was going through my transition. Um, I And because I was doing it in college, I used a lot of the resources there, um, uh, like the counseling services I offered through the university. So that was a big help because I couldn't afford it really outside <laughs> outside of that. Um, and it, the only downside was that every therapist that I did see, they weren't well-versed with dealing with transgender people. So it was really me having to, again, educate and work with them of like, okay, I'm your first client that you've seen that's trans. Um, and, you know, I did a lot of shopping of around for therapists to try to find that support. Um, and I did end up finding one. She was a lesbian, actually. So that helped that she was a part of the community. And she helped me. She kind of talked me through the process to get my letter. Because um, back when I was transitioning, you still needed a letter that said you had gender dysphoria um, in order to start medically transitioning. And she helped me through that process. Um, and it was really smooth with her. And she didn't pressure me or anything like that to say certain things. Um, I did have one therapist before I met her that told me, because I also wanted to work on losing weight. And she told me, oh, well, maybe don't worry about weight loss right now because you being a bigger person helps you to pass as a guy better. And so I quickly switched from seeing her to seeing the therapist that then gave me my letter um, to transition medically. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas? Um, I don't really have much to share about it because I did share my story. Yeah. Um, I think what would be helpful is, uh, I think when knowing that your client, um, who, who might also be a youth is sharing that they're completely ready. And I mean, and they're just checking off the, ch the, the check boxes of, of everything 
correct. Um, I, I think the encouragement of like, after, after hormones, what would you like to experience? Once you start, what would you like to experience? Kind of just creating this co-creation of what could your life be like once it starts and really giving them that vision to play with. I think I missed out on that. Thank you. Um, uh, there are two questions um, uh, in the chat, and I, I want to talk about it from sort of the uh, the way one person puts it, the loss of a child. Yeah, I, I really love that um, question. I think mm -hmm. it's something that could be talked about more often. Um, and oh, please do go ahead. <laughs> okay. And so um, that is something that I surprisingly am experiencing with my own sister at the moment, which I don't know why it's coming up now. Um, but basically, you know, I think that um, if we can't, as now speaking from my community, if we can't just acknowledge where our parents or our family or our friends are in this, like having to learn who we are again, and we're just saying like, well, look at me, I'm still right here. And they're like, but I'm also going through this because you're no longer this person. Mm -hmm. I'm not meaning, I'm not being there with them. I'm not seeing them for where they are. And rather than pushing back, I can just acknowledge where they are and also create a boundary that protects my well-being because your grieving process is for you and it's not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we just, just to clarify, individuals are sort of asking us sort of what the question was. Um, and so um, one of our attendees said, one thing to add is as a parent, we go through a grieving period after we've known for a while about the transition. We lost our son, but gained a daughter. And we have to come to term with terms with the fact that our son is now gone. Um, and so Nicholas explained sort of that process from we have to acknowledge that the parent um, is sort of going through that process. Um, but that's sort of ongoing. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah. Um... I mean, a few weeks ago, my sister shared that she was still grieving me as a little girl. And I, you know, in my mind, I quickly went to, I'm so much better as this person. What are you talking about? Like, I'm still this person either way. But I just, I just had to realize like, whatever that's about, that's about her, you know? And I just want to be your brother. And so maybe I need to um, be there for you as like, a sibling and not like trying to prove to you <laughs> anything about my past because you were there mm -hmm. yeah um an another person uh uh i read uh his comment i came out to my mother in person uh and feel like i ended up taking care of her also felt like i had to defend my identity to her how do you recommend creating effective boundaries surrounding your identity in your life and sorry in your family at work etc yeah uh tj is it okay that i answer yeah go for it so um a while back, we were also presented with a similar question. And something that um, I really got was, what is it that I value about my journey? Mm -hmm. And and what boundaries can I set for it? Uh, sometimes uh, we become an open book, and then we're bombarded with all these things. And then we're like, whoa, <laughs> that's not what I asked for. And so really finding what it is that you value about your transition and then protecting that. Yeah. And I would just add, you know, again, reflecting on the fact that with a grieving process, with how people treat you, it's still just, it's not a reflection of you as a person. It's just whatever internalized things that they're going through that they have to process for themselves. So it's not, that's how you can set that boundary of, it's not about me. Like, I know who I am. I'm centered in my own self. And I don't have to, you know, police myself in order to fit how another person wants me to be for them. So just to keep that in mind. So TJ, I'm going to go back to something you said before. Um, 
And I, I think you're, if I uh, understand this correctly, you're differentiating between sort of the relationship with your coworkers and others and your family. So uh, do you use different language with those different groups? Is the intensity the same? Because um, I, I think I'm a bit more diplomatic when I am with my non-family uh, and I'm not very diplomatic when I am with my family. Is, is that similar to your uh, experience? Well, I'm actually um, a little bit of, no, nah, it's pretty much the same. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit more free-flowing with the family, mm -hmm. you know, and less of the, you know, buttoned up suit and tie with <laughs> with my family. Um, so the language is different, um, but the intensity is also a little different. So I, I don't come off as, you know, I, I'm constantly having to prove to them that this is me. It's more so of a place of now. When I was younger, it was way more intense. Mm -hmm. It was way more fiery. It was made way more in your face. But now, as I've learned where they are in their journeys, it's more coming from a place of understanding of like, okay, I value having you in my life as a family member. Let me see where we can come to meet each other at the same level. Mm -hmm. And if we can't come to that agreement, then that's a boundary that I have to put up because I, I have to protect myself. So if we can't see me for me together, <laughs> if we can't see my humanity as you know, you see it for me and I see it for you, then that's when the boundary just comes up of, well, maybe that needs to be, we limit our interactions with each other. So that's just how it, to protect myself and to make sure that I stay here, that's kind of how I've had to navigate. Okay. Um, uh, Nicholas, do you have anything to add? Uh, I thought that was greatly shared. And um, on a more like dramatic sense, you know, like if you are uh, just letting them walk over you and, and because you don't want to break the relationship or cause any conflict, that's a form of self-harm on your mental and emotional well-being. And so I think boundaries are greatly important. So we're coming towards the end of the time. And so I just wanted to give our panelists um, sort of some last minute thoughts for our audience. And then I know Joseph has something he wants to share with us before we end. But um, TJ, tell us sort of final thoughts for our attendees. Yeah, so really just want everyone to thank you everyone for your participation, for being involved and engaged in everything that we've done so far. Um, and for your thought provoking questions, we really appreciate everyone just diving in and being so open and vulnerable with us. And we want you just to continue having these conversations in your respective circles, um, take the knowledge that you've gained here and use that moving forward in your life um, and just be brave and be bold. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm assuming there's quite a few parents here and, you know, I just want to acknowledge you all for where you are and, and being comfortable enough to share that you, you could still be in a, in a place of grieving your child, even though it's been many years. And um, I'm so happy that you guys can all accept your child for who they are now. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing for all of us to be here in different stages of where we are in this conversation. Thank you, thank you. Joseph? Yes, <clears throat> TJ, I'm gonna do the last bit of slides and then sure. go into the post eval. So just one second. I also see some other chat questions that have come up in the chat that I wish we had more time and that could be a whole other 90 minute discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but know that yes institute we are a living breathing nonprofit right here in south florida and we work with communities all over the united states and in south america in both english and spanish to provide resources for parents provide educational dialogues throughout different communities and for different audiences um if uh tj if you could try to drop in the info at yes, yes. email and i'm going to just wrap this up really quickly with some best practices that you can consider. So um, we do know from research studies that the parental support, especially of young people, is so critical. Uh, we have 
increase in mental health outcomes, anxiety and depressions, um, the disparities start to lessen and relationships with others improve amongst the child. So even though it's difficult sometimes to navigate this conversation, if it's happening in your own family, just a little bit of um, unconditional positive regard towards your child or family member can make a huge, huge difference. Um, always, we're, we're all practicing um, putting our names and pronouns uh, and practicing honoring other people's use of names and pronouns. Um, we also see from research that this also uh, has a direct impact on suicidal ideation and attempt and depression. Um, a lot of major companies, uh, airlines, um, public tourist venues are getting away from the language, ladies and gentlemen, because even in a crowd, I know a little girl is not a lady, she's a baby. So we're, we're just adopting language that fits better for everyone by saying, hello, everyone, welcome sharks. You know, like you can come up with creative names that are like a word that everybody is truly included. Um, also checking on your organizational facilities restroom about making sure there's access. Having gender neutral restrooms is not just for trans and non-binary people. For example, my dad, when he had a female caretaker and he needed assistance going to the restroom, which restroom do they go to? <laughs> or if there's a dad and he has a three-year-old daughter and she needs to use the restroom, what restroom can they go if there's not a gender neutral or family restroom? So we're also as a society taking a look at what are facilities and structures within our facilities and our HR records and our employee name badge uh, on our Zoom chat, putting our names, this is just more welcome and inclusiveness for everyone. 23 states in the US now have a gender non-binary marker on the state ID and also the federal government last year adopted this. Uh, we encourage you as this is self-instructed challenge, um, as we are all learning about our increasingly diverse, beautiful, wondrous world that we live in, an easy, fun thing you can do is pick a video, documentary, podcast about a community that you'd like to learn more about. And here's some um, really great books, movies, references uh, that you can check out and just, you know, do yourself, you know, learn on your own. Um, and uh, some other things that we provide at Yes Institute, we provide family um, community resource navigation. We also connect parents with other parents that are going through a similar experience um, on gender and orientation uh, so that they feel not alone. Uh, it's not everybody feels safe talking to one another about what's going on in their family. So we provide that um, community and safety support we also do courses. We have our youth advisory leadership program, which I mentioned. And you can just email us info at yesinstitute.org goes to all of our staff. And then one of us will follow back with you. We have some upcoming courses. You can check these out on our website. Also our youth advisory leadership council. Um, it's a free program. It's grant funded. Uh, it's for youth between the ages of 13 to 21. We do need parental consent for those 18 and under, but it's a fabulous leadership development and college readiness and college success program that we've developed. So young people can work on their life goals and academic goals in a very safe and supportive environment. So lastly, um, if you all have a smart device, you can um, take your phone and turn on the camera and this will go to a survey. If you're watching this on the recording, um, you won't be able to access this survey, but this is just for our live participants here in the chat. It is anonymous, but at the very end, optionally, if you'd like to uh, give us your email address and you want us to follow up with you, please do so. And within a week, we will get back to you. So that's another way that you can connect with us. And I have to run. Uh, TJ and Nico are gonna stay. Thank you everyone for participating and engaging with us. Um, I have to go start another Zoom so people are not stuck in a waiting room, but TJ and Nico will be back here for a little bit to finish up with everyone.
Well, thank you again. This was fabulous. Uh, I am so happy to have been uh, able to be here uh, and hear this fantastic story um, and the journey that you all have. Um, for our attendees, thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, this was recorded and the recording will be available online uh, at nova.edu forward slash sharks. Uh, so on behalf of the uh, College of Psychology at Nova Southeastern University, thank you so much for joining us and um, we will see you next time. Good night. <laughs>